Hi, I'm Mike Ward. In this video, I'm going to show you just very simply the basic principles of how you value a company, focusing mostly on the discounted cash flow method. Now, before we even start, though, I want to remind you of the two main financial statements that we see uh, in finance, the income statement, which you will recall reflects what happened in the past 12 months. So how much revenue did we generate, what expenses happened, and what was left for shareholders at the end. But it's not just about that. We also have a balance sheet. And to remind you of why we have a balance sheet here, uh, you know that whenever you spend money in a business, the accountants must either expense it, which they will do if that expenditure related to the to something which was going to um, generate revenue over the preceding 12 months so if it's if it's something like wages or some sort of expense it comes in here otherwise it gets capitalized so if you buy a machine or a building or um, there's stuff which lasts more than a year that the company is investing in here it gets capitalized goes on to the balance sheet so here you're going to find a machine which you paid for in cash up front, but each year you are depreciating across here one portion of that, which reflects its useful life, such that the revenues got income and expenses with, which match each other over the most recent uh, 12 months. So one way of understanding that then is when you look at the balance sheet here to realize that you've got you know half the use of a machine and you've got a building which will last a while and there are some there's some raw materials and inventory here which you haven't yet used and sold there are people who haven't paid you yet receivables in other words all of this represents value in an accounting sense which you haven't yet had so you can look at the value of the assets in a balance sheet and say, well, that's what the business is worth, half a machine and a few buildings and so on. It's a good start. But if you uh, bear in mind that accountants always work on historical costs and they've got various conservative conventions in how they value assets. So on the other side of the balance sheet here, you'll find that what you owe the bank is correctly refle reflected here because that's what you owe the bank. But the balancing number here, which is the book value of equity, is likely to be very different to what the market thinks the company is worth if this is a listed company. So if you were to take the number of shares times the share price and compare the market cap of the company to the book value, you're probably going to find, and this would be the average for most uh, listed companies, this is at least twice what this is. So that just you know, requires us to understand that there's a difference. You see, the shareholders are not interested in the assets' historical cost. They want to know what cash flows these assets generate into the future. And we'll talk about the, the near term where we can more or less accurately forecast the say, and the far term, which is what happens thereafter in the long term in the future. And we're going to try and simplify this calculation here. And we bring this back into a net present value by discounting these cash flows at the weighted cost of capital. So that's what we're going to be looking at. Now, we need to constantly bear in mind what we're valuing. The value of the company as a whole, the enterprise value, which I'm calling V here, is the sum of what the shareholders own and what the bank owns of the business. Now, if we're selling the business as a whole, or all of the assets in the balance sheet as a whole, we will be calculating the enterprise value. But sometimes we're only interested in valuing just the shares, and some of the metrics we use only value the shares. So we've got to be aware of whether we're valuing the whole company or just what the shareholders own. So there are main, four main valuation methodologies that we use. The first is if the com company is listed, that's why I'm putting this in uh, brackets here, because if we had a current share price, we'd immediately know what the, the market as a whole thinks of the company. It would just be the equity would be worth the current share price times the number of shares. And uh, so that doesn't mean it's right. Sometimes the market gets it wrong 
and it might be a selling or buying opportunity for investors. So we might want to do our homework as well. But for now, I'm not going to say any more than, of course, if you have this number, you shouldn't ignore it. It's probably the most accurate fix you've got on what the market thinks the share is worth. Now, the um, net asset value, which is what's left inside the balance sheet, I'm not going to spend any time on that because it, it, whilst it's kind of a reasonableness of our valuation, it's really not much more than that. Now, so importantly then, we're going to focus on multiples. And the most common one is the price to earnings ratio, the PE multiple. But we could also use the EBIT or the EBITDA. This is earnings before interest tax, depreciation and amortization. Or sometimes the revenue multipliers to give us a value of the business. Now, one thing to note at this point is that the PE ratio gives you a value only of the equity in the business because it's after interest, as you'll see, whereas these three methods give you a value of the business as a whole, the enterprise value. And so there's a big difference between the answer you get between these two different methodologies. But this is a fairly common and straightforward and easily used ratio. Um, it's low technical input, it's not complicated, and it will give you a fairly good idea of what the business is worth, but based only on the most recent year. So that if the numbers there are a bit out, that could be a problem. Sometimes we have to make adjustments and smooth the earnings and so on. But uh, it's a good start. But more importantly, we want to focus on the discounted cash flow. This is more technical and so on. Uh, I've said it's the more accurate method, most accurate, but again, it depends on where the business is. If you're trying to value Facebook or WhatsApp or many of these new um, uh, internet-based uh, companies, there isn't perhaps any cash flow. You need positive cash flows and so on. And in, in fact, it's pretty hard to value those businesses full stop. Um, that's beyond what we're talking about today. But this, this works best where you've got mature businesses where there's a pretty certain and established cash flow going into the future. So let's come back to multiples briefly. The PE multiple is the current share price of a company. Now, if your company isn't listed, you'll look at ones which are similar in the same industry, same size, same, same sort of markets as you trade in and so on. And you will take their current share price, divide it by their last reported earnings, and you will use this, what we re refer to as a proxy PE, in other words, someone else's price earnings multiple to value your company. So the, the, just to understand this a little more, the units of price are earnings, or sorry, cents per share, and the units of the earnings are cents per share as well, but per annum. Remember that the earnings are what happened in the last year. So if you take that divided by that, you, you get a unit of years. In other words, if you see a PE multiple of, let's say, seven times seven, seven, then what it means is that you, the price you pay to get your money back, you'll have to wait seven years for, unless, of course, the earnings are growing faster. Uh, that assumes a constant earnings. So it gives you some idea of what you're buying. Now, you can also, if you invert the P-E ratio, we take the earnings divided by the price now, that gives you what we call the earnings yield. It also gives you, in this instance, I'm just showing you a 15% here, the implied growth rate in the earnings. So there's some useful information that we can just glean by looking at the number. Now, the discounted cash flow method that we want to focus on here requires us to get cash flows out of the business. Now, mostly these come out of the uh, income statement, what happened in the last year, and we focus on the EBIT, the operating profit. Now, notice it's before interest. Uh, the reason we take it before interest is because we're going to discount these and the cost of interest is actually a cost of capital and it's in the denominator. So if we include it here in the, in the cash flows, we're, we're going to be double counting it. So we take it before interest, but we must take it after tax. You'll see us doing that in a second. 
The other problem, of course, is that we've, we have to worry about depreciation. You'll recall, I mentioned earlier, that when we buy assets, we put them on the balance sheet, and each year we apportion an expense. But it's not a cash flow expense. The cash flow happened when we bought the machine or the building. So this is not actually a cash flow. It's just an expense, an accounting expense. And we have to correct this because we want cash flows. But it's not just the income statement that we have to worry about. It's also what happens on the balance sheet. And so if this is our balance sheet at the start of the year, and it grows to this because we've done some capex, some capital expenditure, and increased our fixed assets, and maybe we've, we've got more, more receivables and more inventory and more working capital, there's been an investment here of um, capital, cash if you like, which we have to take into account. And we would have to subtract this from the cash flow that we're getting from the income statement. So we've got to look at the whole picture here. Now, um, there is usually a, a big difference between what you see here, the earnings and cash flow. And uh, so um, to, to get these numbers that we're interested in here, I've called it cash flow, but technically it's actually the free cash flow. That's what we really mean when we talk about the cash flow in the business. And here's the formula. This is a really important little formula that you can use. We take the operating profits after tax. We sometimes refer to this whole top line here as the net operating profit after tax, no pat. Sometimes Americans will call this earnings before interest, but after tax, E-B-I-A-T. We'll, we'll call it no pat. But we must add what happens as well. Uh, we must add back the depreciation that wasn't an actual cash flow and subtract the capital expenditure on the balance sheet and the increase in net working capital on the balance sheet to get the number we're looking for over here. We then forecast this as accurately as we can, and I'm showing it here for maybe six years into the future. And these will be done based on accurate assessments of the income statement and the balance sheet as far as is possible. And I'm illustrating it for six years. In some instances, you may only need to do two or three because it's a pretty stable, steady, already mature company. In other instances, this may have to go a lot further because the company is growing very quickly. You may even have some negative cash flows up front here because you're still investing. So it depends how, how far we go, how accurate this is, how fast they're growing and so on. The important thing to remember though is that this far term where we're going to approximate the future in just some simple growth rates here needs to be far away enough such that the company is settled down and relatively mature. The good news about discounted cash flow, though, is the further away these cash flows are, by the time you bring them back to the present, the less relevant they are. So the, the important ones are the early ones. Now, we bring them all back uh, in, into an, a net present value, which gives us the value of the enterprise. Now, I'm going to go across to Excel here and demonstrate this quickly. So here I have a company. And I've got just three years of historical income statement information and a balance sheet. You can see there's my assets over here and here is my capital. And it's pretty simple, but it all adds up. Now, step one is to be able to forecast the future. So I'm, I'm assuming you can do this or you've obtained these forecasts from somebody. Um, and this needs to be as carefully done as is possible. So. Once we've got the forecast of the future, you can see I've got my little valuation model set up at the bottom here. We need to first of all work out the free cash flow. We're going to start over here. We're pretending we're at the end of 2017 here, 31st of December, if you like, and these cash flows are going to be coming to us in the future. So I need to pull out my earnings before interest and tax. I've labeled my rows here, so let me just show you this one here. If I, um, sorry, if I, uh, you'll see here, uh, no, that's not going to do it. But the 954 that I'm pulling out here is that number over there. And that's just because I have actually labeled the rows up here. So it finds it easily for me here. And once I've got that, I can just copy that across for the next five years, which is my near-term forecast here. But I need to take it after tax. 
So this will be equal to my earnings before interest and tax times 1 minus the tax rate over here, which I've got down here at 30%. So I'm putting that in, close the brackets. And in other words, I'm only interested in 70% of that because that reflects the, um, the tax that I would pay. Now, don't get worried that this amount of tax, I haven't actually shown the tax, I'm just showing it after tax here, is different to the actual tax paid because the interest would also be tax deductible. But don't panic. Watch the little video I did on the weighted average cost of capital and you'll see that we take it into account where it belongs, which is where the cost of capital is calculated after tax. Now, I also need to add back depreciation because depreciation, um, uh, sorry, I need to say equals depreciation here because um, depreciation isn't a cash flow, as we said, so I need to bring that up. It's pulling that up from above as well. And then I need to work out my capex. Now, I don't have actual data on capex here, but it's easy to work out because if my fixed assets went from 1390 to 1440, that's because I invested more money in it. But I must remember that I also depreciated them over this time as well. So I need to add that back as well. So this is going to be equal to my fixed assets this year. Maybe I can even label that equals um, fixed my fixed assets this year. That's that whole row. But I must subtract this one because, and I'm just doing it as simply as possible here because I want the increase and I must also add the depreciation because this number up here has been depreciated. So that's my capital expenditure for the year. I'm copying that across and then over here I need the increase in my working capital as well. You can see here's my working capital. It's going up. I'm investing money into working capital. Now I want to show you this here so you can see what I've done. Uh, I've taken the current assets and I've subtracted the current liabilities. Now, in this instance, I'm fine, but often you'll find that the accountants have put in here somewhere uh, short-term interest in overdraft and so on here because it is a current liability. But we need to be very careful here that the accounts we put in here must not be interest-bearing. If something uh, has an interest charge against it, it's capital. It's a cost of capital. And we'll be dealing with it in the denominator when we work out the WAC. So if you see in here interest, short-term interest-bearing debt, make sure you don't subtract it. So in my case, I'm okay. I'm subtracting accounts payable. I'm subtracting accrued expenses. Uh, there are no promissory notes here. There might be things like um, deferred tax I could subtract as well. Um, it's free. Those things do not cost me money. Interest does. So we need to just make sure we've got that part right. So I am going to come down here and I'm going to say my I want the increase in working capital. So I'm going to say equals the net uh, working capital, which I've got there. That's that line. But I want to subtract what it was last year, which I'm just keeping simple like that. You will observe that there's quite a big investment in here, and you can see it there. It's, I, that's because we made a lot of changes to this business, in fact, um, over, the, over this year. We changed a lot of operating things in here, and so that's why the working capital has gone up. But thereafter, we're hoping it's going to settle down fairly steadily into the future. Now, my um, free cash flows... Once I've got all of these things are going to be equal to my no patch. Remember, this is our formula. Profits after in, uh, operating profits after tax. Add back depreciation. And then I must subtract capex. And I must also subtract the increase in net increase in net working capital. I must subtract that as well. And uh, you can see everything there. The depreciation isn't being highlighted because it's just pulling it out directly from the income statement there. But that looks good. And I can copy that across for the next five years. So here are my free cash flows. That's what I'm trying to get now. You can see in the first year I'm making some big investments, but thereafter it starts to settle down. If I'm convinced that it's settled down, I could say, okay, let's assume that next year it's going to grow at 8%. 
I'm just making that assumption for now, which means the cash flow here will be equal to that one uh, times uh, one plus this, uh, this number over here. And I can, once I've done that, I could copy this, say, um, I don't want to go forever. In fact, I'm just going for 200 rows. Um, that's 200 years. That's pretty far. If you go too far, Excel kind of runs out of space. So you have to be a bit careful there. But you can see it's steadily growing here. Now, maybe I actually think that the next cash flow will be a little less. I want to wind this down a little bit. So I'm going to say maybe that's 7%. And maybe that's 6%, and then 5%. And then from here on, I'm going to keep it at 5%. So I might fiddle around with my cash flow, sort of steadily decreasing it here to something which is more sustainable. And you will see this is an important part of the valuation. This, this, the result of this can make a very big difference. And I have done a separate video, which I encourage you to have a look at, called... Um, which is about calculating the terminal value, which is all of this over here. Now, we could now work out our enterprise value, which notice I'm lining up in 2017 because that's where I am at the moment. These are all in the future. And to get my enterprise value, I'm going to say it's equal to the net present value. I'm going to use the weighted average cost of capital, which I've got down here at about 12%. And there's a separate video which deals just with that. And then I must take all of these cash flows going for 200 years into the future, and I can put that in. And this is telling me that this business, based on what I've got in here, is actually worth about eight and a half million. Now, often you will see that what uh, people do is they don't extrapolate Excel like I've done here. They approximate all of this into one number here which is, uh, let's just call it the, the terminal value of this business. What you could sell it for, if you like, at the end of 2022. Now, you can't do that if you're changing the growth rate here. So I'm just going to come back here and make all of these 5%. So I've got a constant growth rate here. And I'm going to label this one cell here now, the terminal uh, growth rate. So I've I know what it is. And um, I want you to remember that number, 7915, because I want to show you that we can get rid of all of this. And I need the first one, but I don't need the rest. I can just, whoops, sorry, delete all of those. So here I am over here. And I can calculate all of that in one cell here by saying it's going to be equal to the last cash flow times 1 plus this terminal growth rate. In other words, that gave me the cash flow that would be here, exactly the same number. But I can divide this by WAC, uh, let's just type that in, minus the terminal growth rate here. And this, you will recall, is the formula for a growing perpetuity. I need next year's cash flow which is why I'm doing this part here. I'm increasing it here, and I'm dividing it. The denominator is WAC minus G, where this is the terminal growth rate over here. And it's going to give me an answer. Notice where it is. It belongs in this year because it's, it's, the, present, it's the value at 2022 of the future. Now, if I come back here and I correct my NPV, let's do it again, equals NPV. Uh, I need to use my weighted average cost of capital here. Now watch carefully how I do this. I'm taking just those four cash flows, and then I put a comma, and I'm saying that one plus that one, because they have to be in there together, like that. And I'm pressing Enter, and I should get exactly the same number as we had here with all of this going out forever once I changed this to a constant over here. So you can play around a bit with that and uh, see what's more appropriate. You need to, to let me just reiterate, these, this number needs to be now growing. You need to, to forecast this one way or the other until you've got a reasonable long-term growth rate here. Watch the video that I did on the terminal growth rate, which will give you some guidance about that stuff. Now, we still haven't finished here. This is the, the enterprise value, but if I want to work out my share price, I would need to 
um, pull out the debt because that doesn't belong to the shareholders. So I could say that is going to be equal to, where is my debt? Uh, Long-term total debt. That's what I want to subtract. Anything you pay interest on, and I'm just going to label it there. So I'm pulling out my total debt in that year. You can see it is just over 2 million. Then my equity will be equal to the difference. One, that minus the debt is obviously the equity. If I know I've got, say, 5 100,000 shares in this company, I can take the equity value, divide it by the number of shares, and I'm going to get a share price. In this case, 11.81. Now, we should be quite worried about this because you can see a huge amount of the value is sitting in the terminal value. That's normal, by the way. Now, it's useful for us maybe to get a sort of feel uh, and to do this slightly differently. I want to get another fix on this number. So to do that, I am going to, uh, I've got here, you can see a price earnings proxy for this. This I'm pulling off from other companies which are similar to mine. The average share price to their earnings per share is about 15. So I'm going to come over here and I'm going to, I'm going to pull out my earnings in the final year. So I'm going to say this is equal to, uh, let's see if where our net income is. It's, I've called it earnings after tax actually. So I want to pull out that 696. There it is. Uh, this is going to be, I'm going to call this my net income, just to show you where it is, in that year. And here, let's put it across here. I'm going to pull out that number there. And I'm just labeling it here so we can see. This is my proxy uh, price to earnings ratio. And if I multiply those two things, that times that, that is going to give me a value for the equity. Remember, this just that just gives just gives you the value of the equity, not the whole company. Now I could compare that to that, but this is five years into the future. So what I'd rather do is if I add the debt that I've forecast uh, here, wherever it is, not much debt. Oh, total debt is actually grown a bit. So I want the debt. If I add the debt in here, I'm going to say equals the uh, total debt again here, which is 3280. You can see it over there. Then if I add the equity and the debt here, that plus that, that's giving me the enterprise value. And I'm hoping that's going to compare with that number over there. Well, that is too close to be true, actually. Um, if I'd chosen 4% here, you can see I'm going to get a very different number here, which gives me very different numbers over here. And it would encourage me to go back and say that's 5%. So I'm using this as a kind of um, a, a different way of getting a sense on what this, uh, this growth rate ought to be, a reasonableness test, if you like. Okay, I think that's enough. We've covered a lot of material here. I hope you find that useful.